We'd like to welcome you if you're visiting, and if you're, uh, if you will, just stick around a few minutes. Let us get to know you. And if you need communion supplies, uh, we've got them in the back, or just raise your hand, and we'll help you get them as well. But it's good to see everyone. Uh, a few things upcoming will be uh, Wednesday night service at 7 p.m., and then back at 10:30 a.m. for the adult Bible class here. A uh, few, uh, a few other announcements will be December 4th. That's next Sunday will be a teacher appreciation day. The food will be catered, so you don't need to bring anything at all. And uh, we'd like to, uh, for everyone to stay if you're able to. Uh, again, that'll be next Sunday after the uh, morning worship service. December 10th at 2 p.m. in the building downstairs, we'll have a, a annual Christmas party. Uh, we've not had that in a couple of years, so uh, looking forward to that. And then December 31st, uh, the men will have a prayer breakfast at 9 a.m. in the building downstairs that's december 31st uh, a few few folks on the prayer request uh, it's good to see lynn back with her uh, from cataract surgery she's got more coming up in the near future so that went well um sander keep uh, jackie's wife sander mcmillan in our prayers she has upcoming tests uh harry is at urgent care this morning with uh eye infections so uh I'm not sure what's going on there, but uh, we'll remember him as well. And then Gary, December 8th, has uh, ear surgery coming up. Uh, I think that's it on announcements. Uh, if you get a chance, just uh, when it's not raining, you can take a look at the equipment outside. I think Mark came in, uh, spent the day working on that and staining it. And uh, So anyway, that, that part's done now. And I think that's it on announcements. If you will, let's go to God in prayer. All right, Lord, we thank you for uh, the day you've given us and the rain you're providing for us this morning and, and all your blessings and meeting our needs this morning. Lord, we, uh, we're thankful for all those who were able to come out this morning and gather together and study your word and uh, the folks who come out and talk classes. And Lord, we uh, <clears throat> bless those who are unable to come for whatever reason this morning. Lord, we Reach up, uh, reach out to you for prayers for those listed this morning and uh, for upcoming procedures. And Lord, we pray for those folks and their families. Lord, as we uh, begin our worship service this morning, I pray that we clear our minds of the world and we focus on worshiping you this morning. And be with Brian as he delivers our message. We pray, pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. would turn with me to number 40. Number 40. aren't exactly right uh, up there, so now we're going to sing number 740. Number 740. There's a message. 
680. Now before Lord's Supper, we'll sing number 677. Number 677.
May we pray for the bread. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this morning. We thank you for the good rain that we've enjoyed. We thank you for the many blessings of life that you bestow upon us. Father, at this time, we ask your blessings on uh, this spread as it uh, represents Jesus' body that he so freely gave on the cross at Calvary that we might have the opportunity of everlasting life. We pray that we partake this in a manner pleasing to you. We ask this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. May we pray for the fruit of the vine. Father, again, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to come worship you this morning. At this time, we pray for the fruit of the vine, which represents Jesus' blood. We pray again that we take this in a manner pleasing to you. We ask this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Now that we've concluded the Lord's Supper, if we could offer a prayer for uh, our many blessings. May we pray. Our Heavenly Father, we know that uh, these many blessings that you bestow upon us come to us through you, whether they are spiritual or material. Uh, we know that we're very thankful. At this time, let us willfully and cheerfully give back a portion of those uh, material blessings to be used in your work. We pray that the men will uh, use these in a, in a manner pleasing to you. We ask this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. morning. Today's scripture reading will be coming from the Gospel of John, the Gospel according to John chapter 3, verses 3 through 8. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say, to you, and I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but you cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Good morning. Good to see you. It's been a good week. Uh, we uh, we had a two-part Thanksgiving. I don't know about you. Enjoyed it immensely. We, uh, we went to Lisa's mom, uh, her home, Thursday, and then 
Yesterday, we had a bunch of people at our home, which is always interesting to get, uh, I don't know, 35 or 40 people in your house when you're used to only four, but uh, we had a great time. Everybody seemed to get their feel. You know, I was uh, thinking about it. You know, Thanksgiving's my favorite holidays time. I love Thanksgiving for a lot of different reasons. I appreciate what Doug shared with us third, uh, Wednesday at our midweek about the need to be thankful. And, and one of the reasons I love Thanksgiving is it, it's that reminder to me to count those many blessings, right? And to think about all the different ways God has been so good to me. Paul tells Thessalonians what? Be thankful in everything. Give, we're to always appreciate and to give gratitude toward God. And, and Thanksgiving is a wonderful time to do that, and as well as like this morning is a wonderful time to say thank you. I also love Thanksgiving because it's a time when we get to be with family. You know, there are family members uh, like yesterday that we won't see again until next year or into the future. Not everybody comes to Thanksgiving every year. And so there, there are family members and, and, and extended uh, friends who, who come and are, take part in that who, who we don't get to see very often. And so it's always interesting to look around where you are and to see all the different conversations going on and, and to see people interacting with one another and asking questions, like trying to get to know one another again to, to go over, okay, so this year what happened? Uh, you know, and, and you get to go back to that's important for us. And I love to take part in that. And... You know, you think about all the questions that maybe come up in those conversations and, 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 and asking questions about, you know, somebody's well-being, maybe a job change, maybe, you know, what's going on with their kids or their grandkids. Those are important conversations. I want to start this morning by looking at a particular conversation that occurred in John chapter 3. I'm sorry, we're going to John 3. So there's two passages I want you to, to, to look at this morning. We're going to spend some time in John chapter 3 in just a few minutes. I also want to look at another conversation in Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10, and then in, we're going to move over to John chapter 3. And... And when you get to Mark chapter 10, if you go down to verse 13, you see there how Jesus is, is teaching. And, and in the midst of all this, he, he's kind of, in a public sense, he's at the height of his popularity. So there are all these people who are coming to, to hear from Jesus, who, who, are, who are coming to be healed by him. And... One particular group is mentioned in verse 13. It says there that, that children, I presume by their parents, are being brought to Jesus that he might touch them. But the disciples rebuked those people and said, don't do that. But when Jesus saw it, what was his response? He was indignant. He was angry about it. And he says to his disciples, let the little children come to me. Don't hinder them. For such belongs to the kingdom of God. And I want you to note what he says in verse 15. I truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and bless them, laying his hands on them. Such a powerful moment, but also a very sweet moment. You imagine Jesus uh, could have been very elevated. You know, sometimes we get people who, who have popularity who kind of elevate themselves above others. That's not how Jesus worked. 
And so here he is, he's having all these children, they're coming to him, and, and that image of Jesus picking them up and setting them in his lap, and just having a conversation. Now it's right on the heels of that that you get to the second part of this. Now I think that's, this is interesting, at least it is to me, maybe it will be to you. But what did he say? The little ones, if we do not become like them, we cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Now notice verse 17. And as he was setting out on his journey, he's getting ready to leave, a man ran up to him and knelt before him and asked him. Now before I get into the question, I want you to note who this is. What did he just say? Let the little children, the young ones, come unto me. We know from later in this passage, this is a young man. Now that kind of struck me when I kind of put two and two together. He just said, let the little ones come unto me. I know this is an older person, but yet again, he's noted as a young man. This young man runs up to Jesus. Now he's just said, let... Let those who are young, those who are innocent, come to me. And I love this young man's question. It's an important one. He says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, there's two aspects I want to look at this morning in this regard. Number one, I want to look first at Jesus' initial response, and then I want to look at the question he asked. So when he says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What's Jesus' initial response? It's kind of awkward, unexpected, out of the blue. What's his response? Why do you call me good? Now, you ever ask a question of someone and they, they, they don't answer your question, at least initially, they pick out something you said in your question? Is that annoying? Of course, when Jesus does it, he's not trying to be annoying. He's not trying to be dismissive. He's trying to point something out. He's trying to point out some deeper meaning to this young man that the young man doesn't even realize. Now notice, he says, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Except God alone. This concept of good, you know, there's a lot of different definitions that that we could use here uh, or, or maybe that we think about in regard to good. We may think, Man, that turkey was good. Oh, that pumpkin pie that just hit the spot. That was so tasty. It was so good. You could say, you know, I've got a good job. I've got a good job. I've been blessed with with good employment. What does that mean? That means I, I either I'm doing what I love or I get a nice paycheck at the end of the week or two weeks. Right? See, good could mean lots of different things. It could also mean, though, and it, it could be a reference to how we behave. Now, the only way we're going to know that is to look at the context. Now, what did he say? Good teacher, good rabbi. And Jesus says, why do you call me good? Now, that young man may have intended it to be Man, you're such a fine teacher. You're such a good teacher. You're a good instructor. I don't think, though, that's what Jesus intends by the word. He says, we know that because of what he goes on to say. He says, no one is a good except God. So he's pointing to some characteristic of God himself. Now, I heard someone talking about this passage from a philosophical point of view. And I thought it was very interesting. He was talking about this concept of of God. Now, he's an agnostic. And he was talking about why why the concept of God terrifies him. That's interesting, isn't it? Does God terrify you? 
He's terrified by the concept of good. And he said, he explained why. He said, the, the concept of God, if that's a reality, and then when I look at God and I look at myself, I am terrified to think that there is a being who is morally perfect. And then when I look at my own life and I realize I am anything but, I thought that was very interesting. And he goes on and he talks about it in very flamboyant language and very big words. But the overall concept is this idea of, of God as the perfect being. Now think about that just for a minute. What does it mean to be morally excellent, morally good? It's hard for us to really grasp that. Because you and I live in a reality where we understand that you and I are not morally good. And if you think you are, I, I would beg you to reflect on your life. None of us are. I, I like the way the book of Romans deals with this, with this, um, this concept here in, in this idea of of moral excellency. If, if you go to Romans and, and, and you think about this concept of what it means to be moral, of what it means to be virtuous, there's some challenging passages there. I really believe the whole book of Romans, and when you consider the, the text there, it's really Paul challenging the Jewish mindset of superiority in regard to morality and how they're really not morally excellent on their own. And, and there's a whole lot of reasons for that. I don't have time to dig into that in depth. But I want you to notice what, what he says in Romans chapter 3. And, and he, he, so real quickly, a synopsis of the first three chapters, really the first four chapters sort of, is this idea of moral corruption. Chapter 1 of Romans deals with the moral corruption of the Gentile world. And he spends some, some deep time, uh, deep discussion time on, on the moral corruption of the Gentile world. Chapter 2, however, says, okay, you Jews, you're morally corrupt as well. And, and then you get to chapter 3, and he just says it straight out. You're all morally corrupt. All of you are sinful. All of you are, are, are filled with sin. Notice what he says in verse 9. He says, what then? Are Jews better off? No, not at all. For we all charge, uh, sorry, for we have already charged that all, both Jew and Greeks, are under sin. Verse 10 None is righteous, no, not one. Verse 12, no one does good, not even one. And just to kind of put a big bow on it, go to verse 23. For all have sinned, all have become morally corrupt and fallen short of what? of the glory of God. The moral, uh, the, the most moral perfect being, we have fallen short of him. Back in Genesis chapter 3, when Satan said to Eve, you shall be like God, why that lie is so devastating is because it brought into her conceptual thinking that she could be like God. She cannot be like God. That's why God put her in an environment, in Adam, an environment where they would not be challenged with the understanding of good and evil. We cannot be like God. We are all sinners. He goes on, in verse in chapter 5 and verse 12 to say therefore just as sin entered in, or came into the world through one man 
death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. Now, there's an important concept that's introduced in chapter 5. Now, he had to, he had to lay the groundwork in chapters 1 through 3 uh, of, of the fact we're all sinners in order to get to chapters 5 and then one he get into later in the book. Number one, we're all sinners. Number two, because we're sinners, because we're all morally corrupt, there is a judgment, there is a payment coming due. What is that payment? Death and punishment. And that's an important concept for people to understand. Now, God gave us a free will. We talked about that this morning in Bible class. We all have the ability to choose. You can choose and you will what you want to do in regard to God, to Jesus, to His sacrifice, His blood. That's your choice. But I want you to understand what that means. Jesus wants you to understand what that means. That goes back to the rich man's, the young rich man's question. What shall I do to inherit eternal life? What's What's understood in that is that you and I, there's something required of us in order to get to eternal life. And so in Romans 5 and verse 12, there's a payment due. So anytime you and I sin, we are continuing to corrupt ourselves, but we're also continuing to incur debt. We all know this from a financial stand, standpoint. <laughs> My son was asking me this week, he said, do I have to get a job? Dad, do you have to have a job? It's like, no, I don't have to have a job. But, but if, I want, if I want the family to have a place to live, if I want to be able to put food on our table, if I want to be able to buy things that are necessary and many things which are not necessary, then I'm going to have to find some way to pay for that. Now, I do that through earning a living. Me and my wife earn a living, and then we're able to buy things. But we also understand that any purchase that we make incurs a debt that must be paid. Now, in a spiritual conception, on a much deeper level, sin incurs a debt. There is a debt that must be paid in regard to your free will. God says, sure, you can freely choose, but I want you to understand that every time you choose sin, you incur a debt that must be paid. There's a bill that will come due. And so later on in chapter 6, in verse 23, what does he say? For the wages, for the debt that's due, for the wages of sin is death. Now, hey, you're going to make your choice. You're going to decide what you want to do with your life. You can choose whether to obey God or not. That's yours. But understand there is a, a payment that must be made for that choice. What was the payment that was required on the part of Adam and Eve? Now, they had a choice. They could continue to refuse that knowledge. A knowledge of good and evil. They could have continued to live in the garden freely. But once they said, okay, I need to know that, that cost them something. There was a debt that was incurred upon them, and that was having to leave the garden and leave the tree of life. When you and I choose to freely sin, we are choosing to pay the debt. And it's a choice we all must make. For all have sinned, and fallen short of the glory of God. It's something none of us can get around. 
And so we come back to that question, how can we overcome our sin problem? How can we pay a debt owed? Now here's the reality of it. You can't. You cannot pay that debt. You have no capital to pay it with. How would you pay for a spiritual debt? What do you have to offer in that regard? What is it that you could give to God that He doesn't already have? There's absolutely nothing on our part that we can do to pay the debt. Now, I'm going to come back to that part, and don't get me confused. What's taught by some that there's nothing absolutely we're required of us That's not the point. The point is, there's nothing you and I can do to pay off that that, that debt we owe. And so we ask, well, that sounds like a pretty depressing place, doesn't it? Now, if the Bible just explained that to us, it'd still be valuable, right? If that's all it did, it'd still be good information, But it wouldn't give us very much hope, would it? I want to go back to um, Romans chapter 6 and verse 23. You know the, the end of that text, don't you? I hope you do. For the wages of sin is death, but, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's imagine for a minute that you and I did something really stupid and we got ourselves in jail. Now, when you and I break the law, we incur a debt, don't we? We incur a debt to society for violating society's, our government's law. However, we find ourselves in that imprisonment for something we did, and our parent or loved one comes and pays that, that, that fee to allow us to be freed from that, is there anything we've done to earn that? It's a free gift, maybe not willingly given or to, happily given, but is given willingly to allow us freedom. Now, our sin incurs a debt that imprisons us. There is nothing we can do on our own to seek freedom, yet God, out of His benevolence, not His goodness, not His goodness, God does not owe us anything. I think sometimes we get that misunderstood. God did not have to send Jesus to the cross. God could have been perfectly good to destroy us in the flood. God could have been perfectly good to allow us to go on to death and into hell, and he would, His goodness would have not been changed one iota. It is not out of the goodness of God, it's out of the love and benevolence of God. God is a good God despite us. He is good because of His very nature. But out of His love and benevolence for us, He sent Jesus. And that's why I want to go to John chapter 3. I want to spend just a few minutes here in John chapter 3. So it's an interesting discussion you have going on. You have... You have a man named Nicodemus who is a Pharisee who's on uh, seemingly the Sanhedrin, which is the ruling council of the Israelites. And he's become fascinated with this man named Jesus. This is Jesus guy, this character in Jesus, has been going around and he's been teaching this, this, this new theology or this... Um, uh, 
there's something that, that's like Judaism, but it's not like the Judaism or the law of Moses that I've heard about. He's teaching concepts about, about the kingdom of God, uh, about um, you know, things in regard to the, to the coming Messiah that, that I've never heard. And so Nicodemus, I don't know why, but the text does tell us he comes at nighttime. Now maybe it's to not be seen by others. I think that's probably what happened, but don't know for sure. But he chooses to come and meet Jesus in the evening. We don't even know how that arrangement was made. Somehow Nicodemus reached out to Jesus and said, I would like to meet with you. And so Jesus says, yes, and they meet together. And if you go to the text there and you, you, you look at what's going on, it says, verse 2, this man, Nicodemus, came to Jesus by night and said to him, now notice how he addresses Jesus. There's already some kind of built-in respect that it's, that it's already begun to, to come out of the heart of Nicodemus. He calls him rabbi. Now that rabbi word is not just some kind of simple term. It was a term of honor and respect in Judaism. It was only given to those who had attained a certain knowledge of the truth, of the Word of God, and were able to communicate that to others. And so he says, Rabbi, teacher, we know, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these things. Now where did his faith, his beginning of faith come from? from the signs Jesus did, from the miracles. He saw those things, and unlike most of those leaders of the Jewish people, he didn't just refuse what, what they were. He realized what it meant. This man's doing things that just simply are not possible. And so he's already begun on this road of understanding Jesus and even beginning to have faith in him. No one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. That's a powerful statement right there. Think about what he just said. He said, no one could do what you do unless God, Jehovah, Yahweh, is with him. And then Jesus says something that I don't know that Nicodemus was expecting. He says, no, uh, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus is thrown off his footing, isn't he? Because then he asked, and I wonder if he began to wonder, okay, who is this guy I'm talking to? This makes no sense. But he says, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he go, uh, sorry, can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? So obviously he's not, he knows there's something Jesus is trying to say, I believe, but he's not getting it. He's not understanding it. And, and so he says, what are you talking about? Truly, truly, Jesus responds, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And so he further complicates the, the, this, the understanding of Nicodemus by introducing two concepts, water and Spirit. Now, he has not really gotten into a further discussion here, but but remember what he's explaining. He's explaining about rebirth. He's not explaining about birth. He's explaining about rebirth. And he says that rebirth requires both water and the Spirit. Now it goes on. In verse 6, uh, verse 7, to say, You must be born again. And so this concept of being born again. And then it seemingly, Jesus goes off on a tangent. But he's going to tie all this back together in just a minute. But he goes kind of off on a tangent. And he, he, he reflects back at an earlier time in verse 14. And you notice there he says, 
And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Now, we go back in the book of Numbers. We see that event occur where, where God is angry with the people and he sends serpents in amongst them to, to bite them and to punish them, to kill them. And, and so all these serpents are, are, are going all throughout the camp and they're biting these people. And eventually they wake up and they say, Moses, go to God for us, please, and, 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 and ask God to take this away. I'm paraphrasing, but God does that. But God does something fascinating. Now, what God could have done in that moment was just take away the snakes, right? Wouldn't that have seemed the most easy thing to do? Just heal everybody who's been bitten, take away the snakes, or you know, just get them out of there. That's not what he does. He has Moses make the image of a snake and put it on a pole and to set it up high. And God says, if you look at the serpent, you'll be healed. Now, why does God do that? Now, there's, there's some definite uh, discussion we could get into about that, but one of the things that occurred to me this week in thinking about this again was, what is God trying to do for the people? Number one, he's trying to, to get them to understand they need to repent and turn back to him. But by, by looking at that image, now, what was biting them on the ground? Snakes. Now, God didn't put some kind of uh, uh, roadrunner who likes to eat snakes up on a pole, right? You'd think... The opposite, right? You think uh, the thing that kills the snakes, that's what you put on the pole. He didn't do that. He put a snake. Why? Why would he do that? Could it be that God is trying to get them to face the thing they're afraid of? The thing that has caused them pain. To give them awareness of what? Of the cost of sin. Of the cost of sin. Jesus goes on to say, you know how Moses lifted up that serpent? So also, or so must, the Son of Man be lifted up. Why did God, why couldn't God have just said, you know what, if you just come to me and, and, and you'll pray a prayer of asking for forgiveness, I'll just forgive you. Why didn't God just send some magical lamb to, to give forgiveness? You just go offer this lamb and you put its blood on your head and you're, you're good. Why did, why, why did he do it the way he did it? Could it be, could it be that we need to look and to see the cost of our sin? To know you, yes, you, put him there. Why does God have us every Sunday to remember the sacrifice of Christ. Could it be that you need to see it? That you need to face what you've done? Not just to cover it up. Not just to forget about it. But to face the reality of where you are. We need to see Jesus high and lifted up. And we need to know I put him there. Every ache, every pain that he felt was my fault. And my sin cost something. And it is a debt that must be paid. First Corinthians 15, Paul, I'm sorry, before I go there, 
Let me come back to John 3.16 in just a minute, but let's go to 1 Corinthians 15. Paul, in speaking to the Corinthian brethren, he, he says in verse 1, I want to remind you, brothers, of something. I want to remind you that of the gospel, of that which I preached to you, of that which you received, in, in that which you stand, in which that you are saved. Verse 3, For I deliver to you of first importance what I also received. This is the message Ananias brought to Paul, Saul at the time. This is the same message Paul needed to hear. Paul needed to look at, high, at him high and lifted up. Paul needed to feel every whip of the lash across the back of Jesus. He needed to feel every time he had to raise himself up to feel those nails in his hands. Paul needed to feel that. We need to feel it too. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried and that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. They needed to see that. They needed to feel that, that their sin incurred a deep cost. John chapter 3 and verse 16, later on in that conversation, what did Jesus say to Nicodemus? For God so loved, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him, has faith in Him, should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that through Him the world might be saved. We need to see Him. And we need to know that I put Him there. In the book, in the Gospels, at the end of Gospels, of Mark's Gospel and the end of Jesus' Gospel, Jesus gives this imperative to the disciples. He said, Go into all the world and proclaim the Gospel. What's the message they are to preach? Well, Paul said it, didn't he, in 1 Corinthians 15. That which I heard myself, that which I uh, told you, that which you received, that which you stand, that which you saved, that which is of most importance, that Christ died for you, that he was buried for you, that he rose again for you. Go proclaim that message. And whoever believes and is baptized shall be saved. However, he who does not believe, those who choose to say, God, I know what you did, but you know what? I don't need it. Understand there's a cost incurred. And you will be condemned. If we refuse Jesus, we will go to hell. That's a shocking message, but it is one we need to know. Just understand there's a cost. If you refuse Jesus, there's a cost. Matthew 28, 19, Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Understand that cost. Second Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 8, and talking about the second coming of Christ, Paul says, When Jesus comes, he'll come in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and those who have not obeyed the gospel. There's a cost incurred. There's a cost to your salvation. 
Here's the wonderful news, the message of Scripture. It's already been paid. It's already been paid for you. Jesus already paid that cost. He went on that cross for you. Romans chapter 6. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? uh, God forbid, certainly not. How can we who died to sin live any longer in it? Do you not know that all of you who are baptized into Christ, what? Were baptized into His death so that as Christ was raised from the dead, you might be as well. By the glory of the Father, we might too walk in newness of life. Jesus paid the price. And so Peter will say in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21, baptism now saves us. Not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. There is no power in this water. There is no power in this water. We do not teach nor believe in, in the power of the um, regeneration power of water. We're not the church of baptism. But baptism is the way in which we get to the power source. And that's Christ. He is the one that paid the debt. He is the one that's offered us this pathway to forgiveness. Have you been immersed into Christ with forgiveness of your sins? Now understand, God's going to let you make whatever choice you want to make. It's yours. However, understand the consequences. Understand that if you walk away and you continue to walk away, there's a debt that's going to have to be paid. Either you will pay it or God will pay it for you and has already paid it for you. What will you do with Jesus? Next week, I want to go a little further from here and talk about this concept of re- rebirth and baptism. And we'll, we'll look at some other concepts. But this morning, if you're not a Christian, why? Why do you refuse? Why do you refuse? If somebody said, I have a million dollars, and it's yours. It's yours. You just have to take it. How many of us would refuse that? I don't need that. That wouldn't help me in my life at all. I'll just live like I've been living. Right? Maybe, maybe you're humble enough to do that. I think most of us would take the money, wouldn't we? Most of us could see the good that could be done with that. Wouldn't it be silly to kind of walk away? It'd be kind of silly. Nothing else, you go and give it to the work of the church, right? Spend your life in in that kind of endeavor. There's something so much more valuable that God has offered to you. Will you continue to refuse Him? Will you continue to refuse God's gift? This morning, as you're sitting here, do you need to respond to the call? Do you need to respond as we stand and as we sing? With the Lord, I cannot live without thee. I cannot try to take one step alone. I cannot fail to life again. I need thy strength to leave myself alone. Be saved, Lord. Just red tongue, it is for the time.
Let's see number 800. Number 800. First and last verses. <laughs> Number 763, number 763, and then we'll be dismissed in prayer. Again, I'd like to thank everyone who's uh, here this morning, particularly if you're visiting with us. We appreciate uh, your presence. Number 763. Father, we're thankful for this opportunity, again, that we've had to come and to worship you and to assemble here. Thank you, Father, for each one that's here. We pray that you would bless us, help us to take the messages and the things that we've heard today and to have the courage and the determination to make changes in our lives as needed. Father, we ask that you would be with those who have been mentioned, who are facing uh, physical struggles, our brother Harry and, and others, and we'd ask that you might uh, strengthen them. Father, we're particularly mindful of those who are struggling spiritually, uh, whether noted or not, Father, uh, you know those who, who are struggling to stay on the path, and we pray that you might be with each of us uh, in that walk, uh, that you might strengthen us, Help us to always be reminded of your steadfast love, that your mercies are renewed every morning, and how you're willing to, to renew us uh, 
and to uplift us, help us, Father, to be humble in spirit, uh, that we might uh, be willing to accept that and to reach out to you uh, with a pure and honest heart. Father, we ask that you would be with this congregation here in Sanford. Help us uh, not to be selfish and uh, help us, Father, to um, uphold each other ahead of ourselves, that we might be unified uh, in your truth. We thank you so much for your son, and what he means to us, and what he means to the world. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.